อะระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมตัสสะบะคะวะโทอะระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะอะปารุธาเดสังมะทัสสะทาวะราเยโสตวันธาบะมุญ
we can make a case for these things. We, if we were a healthy person, we wouldn't have any of these emotions. The idea of the normal person is a, is a, is a, is a fantasy of the mind, isn't it? Do you know any really normal people? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's a kind of, it's an idea we have that there is. Uh, the only real normal person would be an arahant. Uh, one who's, who's seen through the illusion. There's no more attachment to the delusions of the mind. When I chant in the beginning of this talk, the Namotasa, then I chant, Aparuta De Sangamatasa Tawara, this is a statement the Buddha made after his enlightenment. He said, The gates to the deathless are open. The, this is a significant statement, the gates to the deathless. This has always fascinated me in my spiritual uh, evolution, the, this particular phrase, because it, it means a lot to me. It's a, a statement made by the Lord Buddha, and, and at least this is in the tradition, he's supposed to have said this, but it is a, it is something very wonderful to 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 make this statement. The gates to the deathless are open. Now this is we have to figure what what does that mean? What does that how does that apply to this present moment? I mean he sa- he he said this two thousand five hundred and forty two years ago. Was he wrong? Is he just, uh, or is he misquoted? It doesn't matter whether he actually ever said it or not, but it is a reflective statement. And it's, it's a statement saying, wake up and, uh, and uh, the gates to the deathless are open. You can realize the deathless. It's not, the deathless isn't something uh, that, that uh, is far away or is, abstract, or just deny somebody's idea, or something remote. So that this, this uh, statement is an announcement of the potential that we all have as human beings to, to realize, to, to know directly the deathless reality. And then the second line is, Ye soda one ta bamunjan tu zatang, which is ye soda one. A soda one ta is one who listens, who pays attention, one who is awake, one who is attentive and and here and now. The 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 mind is open, receptive. A soda one ta is state of receptivity. Those who can be receptive, who are open, who can hear, uh, trust in this, trust in yourself. Bamunjantu satang, satang is a word for faith, have faith or relax with faith. Bamunjantu is like a kind of surrendering to faith in this, in the, in the deathless, in this present moment. So that this is a, this is the encouragement to, in the attitude towards meditation is not a striving attitude to attain and to get rid of things. And you're not to get rid of your defilements, your kilesas, your, your uh, faults, uh, and to try to become something. But it's, it's saying, open up pay attention to life as you're experiencing it now and trust in, in your ability just to receive life as experience. You don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to straighten out all the crooked bits or solve every problem or, or justify everything or, or try to make everything better. Because that's where we get we, we, we lose it. We're always trying to 
become better. We always think there's something wrong. There's always something wrong with me the way I am. Uh, I have to do something to make myself better. Well, there's something wrong with with uh, the people we live with, or something wrong with the monastery, something wrong with the retreat center, something wrong with the United States. <laughs> there's always a sense there's something wrong. And in the conditioned realm, when you're just living only on a con- in, with conditioning, then there's a kind of truth to that. There is always something wrong. <laughs> Because conditions themselves are changing. They can't find any stability, any kind of permanent perfection in the conditioned realm. Even though we, we are subjected to, to maybe peak moments where everything is wonderful and just what we want and as it should be. But you can't sustain the conditioned realm out of peak moment. There's no way it reaches a peak, just like your inhalation reaches a peak. You can't hold that for very long. You have to inhale, exhale. So you can't just live at that point of inhalation when it reaches its peak. <laughs> well, the same applies to to everything, the, to the successes and and all the good things of life, the happy times, the the good relationships, the the um, high, the, the peaks of success, happiness, and good fortune. Uh, they are enjoyable, definitely, and uh, is not to be despised. But to put your faith in something that is in this process of changing, and once it reaches peak, it can only go the other direction. So then. You're not asked to, to take refuge in wealth or in other people or in countries or political systems or in relationships or in nice houses or good retreat centers or anything like that, but to take refuge in what is a true refuge, in your own ability to be awake, to pay attention to life in whatever state, condition, uh, the, 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 our quality that conditions might be in in the present. Good, bad, pleasant, painful, um, uh, being praised or being criticized or whatever. Just the awakened willingness to acknowledge these for what they are as conditions changing liberates us from being caught in the in the power of attachment, in the endless struggles that we have with the the emotions or the thoughts or the conditioned realm that we're experiencing. Notice how much, how difficult it is in meditation if you're if you're one who's trying to resist things all the time. Just notice what trying to get rid of bad thoughts or get rid of emotional states or get rid of pain. This doesn't, just observe uh, if you're one of those kind of people that, that are always kind of resisting, trying to push away, get rid of, control things. What does that do? What is the result of resisting or resisting evil? When you're trying to get rid of evil or resist evil, what, what is the result of that? Now, from my reflections on this, when I do that, I find I get obsessed by it. I'm always in a state of trying to get rid of what I don't like in my mind. And that resistance itself is, is an attachment, and it's always, I'm always somehow making a big deal out of this thing. And, and you, so you're just kind of pushing, 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 and then and, and the more you push, the more obsessed you become with it, the more hopeless it seems. I remember when I was in, uh, I used to be a, a graduate student at University of California in Berkeley many, many years ago. And, uh, and I was in the, this uh, Asian Studies program. 
And at that time, we had, uh, I was taking, I was, uh, uh, I, had, I was in a seminar on, on uh, Mahatma Gandhi, it was a graduate seminar. And they were talking about non-resistance to evil. I remember being quite fascinated by this, the non-resistance to evil, because I was brought up to resist evil. And then my, my background was always, you, you know, the evil forces you've got to resist, otherwise they'll take you over. So there is, I felt a kind of, almost a, a fear arise when the, when the uh, lecturer was talking about non-resistance to evil. And I, I felt, uh, I felt something kind of, a fear enter my, my body, because it was like challenging this, something that, that seemed so right to me, that you had to resist, that evil it was something that you had to resist at all costs. And yet Mahatma Gandhi was, was, was obviously, to me at that time, very much a saint, you know, and he was, he was teaching non-resistance. Then years later, becoming a Buddhist monk and starting to practice meditation, I could test this out. And I could see, just, just through, through meditation, resistance to evil empowers evil. What you don't like, what you don't want, what you hate, what you're frightened of, all of these things, when you resist them, you, they, you're actually empowering them. You're giving them tremendous influence and power over your conscious experience of life. But when you uh, welcome, open to the flow of life in both its good and evil aspects, this kind of openness, then you're then then the the evil tendencies that you might be experiencing. What happens to them? Well, this is from my experience. I don't know about you. Maybe you work in a different way. <laughs> but I'll share what I know from, from my experience, is that when I'm accepting and welcoming conditioned experience, doesn't mean I like it, doesn't or approve. It's not, it's not a judgmental thing. I'm not making uh, uh, moral judgments about, about anything. But I'm acknowledging the presence of whatever in a, in a welcoming way. And I know that in this welcoming way, the more I really trust in it, then things drop away from me. It's like they, they, they come in and they, they go away. You're, you're actually opening the door. You're letting the, all the fear and all the anxiety and the worry and the, the resentments and the anger and, and grief and all that, you're, you're, not getting, you're not trying to get rid of it by resisting it. You're not holding on to it and identifying with it. You're totally accepting it as it exists in the present. And then you'll, find, you'll begin to recognize the cessation of those conditions, realize cessation of them, not through your aversion, because the more you're averse to them, the more you attach to them. Now think of somebody you really hate a lot, and you, and you think a lot about them. You know, and you're somebody you really can't stand, who really, really hurts your feelings, and, and uh, you really resent them and are angry. You, those very conditions obsess our minds with that particular person. So in this Ye Soda Wanta Bamun Jantu Satang, the Soda Wanta, I like this word Soda Wanta because it's it's like the, those who are attentive to the to life in the present as it is. Like ability to listen, isn't it? it listening includes everything. When you open, you might just be listening to my voice, but if you really listen to the moment, you'll hear other things. 
the the listen, ability to listen can focus on one sound or can receive everything at one moment. You can hear the night sounds. You can hear the silence. You can hear your own mind thinking when you're in that state of awareness and kind of attentiveness, listening in the in a kind of expansive way, in an expansive expanding consciousness rather than than narrowing it down to one uh, particular point. So this ability we have say, to open our mind, our heart to the to life, to the flow of life as it is, without picking and choosing, saying, I'm only going to accept this and that I don't want. That's what we do when we're caught up. Our egos are very much based on identification with conditions. Wanting to only have, I want happiness, I want to be healthy, I want to be successful, I want to be respected, I want to be loved, I want to praise. Uh, these are what I want, and I'll feel happy if I get a lot of praise and a lot of love and success and good health. <laughs> uh, make me feel good. And this is what they call America the, uh, the feel-good society. <laughs> and then, then what I don't want is bad health. Who wants bad health? You know, to be sick and weak and diseased, and who wants to be criticized and looked down on and despised and disrespected? And who wants to suffer? And um, who wants to be blamed for things? You know? So the, this, this is, there's these, these, uh, these are the two sides in the, of the conditioned realm. The good side, the, the white side, the bright side, the happy side, and then the other side, the dark side. So, but the thing is, in conditioned realm, when you have, when you attach to one, you get the other. So, even life at its peak moments has a, a, a kind of suffering quality to it. Because you think, well, now everything's fine, you know, I'm success, I'm happy, healthy, wealthy, wise, loved, respected. I know I'm, I can't keep it this way, it's going to change. Right? There's always a kind of dread, even when you're at the peak and everything's just wonderful. And there's, there's also the knowledge that you can't keep it all that way. Like being a champion, a, 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 a boxing champion, or being a a, a, a box office success in the in the movies, or you can't, you know, you get the kind of peak moments when you win the Academy Award or get the trophy. But along with that comes suffering, isn't it? The suffering of knowing that it you can't sustain that peak. I remember in, uh, we have a branch monastery in Italy. I remember one time uh, going there, this friend of mine, Italian man, he was saying, you know, Ajahn Samir says, I'm, I've never been so happy in all my life. He said, right now my life is, is wonderful. He said, I, I'm, I have a wonderful wife. We've, we've been married for 10 years. We're still in love. We have a beautiful child. I have a good job, nice house, good place to live, everything's just wonderful. There's nothing wrong with my life. He said, for the first time, he said, I realized that I've got everything I want, everything is perfect. He said, I know it's not going to stay this way. <laughs> now, he's quite aware of the, of the, of the, of the suffering that goes along with, with even the best of the condition realm. So it's like two sides of the same coin. You grasp the coin, you get, 
you get heads and tails together, even though you might be only looking at heads at the moment. But in reflective awareness, you're, you're accepting both, heads and tails, the dark and the, and the, and the light, the good and the bad. And, and the, the human mind, we're capable of embracing opposites without having to, to just resist and control and manipulate our minds and the world around us and to, to give an illusion of security. So much of modern suffering and anguish that people have in, here in the United States is around creating illusions of security. You know, wanting life insurance and health insurance and insurance for everything. Uh, and fire insurance, insurance that everything, everything is, is covered by insurance. <laughs> if I get all, enough insurance, maybe I'll be happy. <laughs> and then, or the, the thinking, if I get what I want, I'll be happy. And when you get what you want, you are happy, but you can't sustain that happiness. A temporary kind of brief moment of happiness, and you can't stay that way. So happiness is not the goal of the of the spiritual life. Not to just be happy, but to awaken to life and to develop wisdom in this awakened state, awakened awareness. Because so much of what we have to experience in life is rather unpleasant. It's just part of the deal of being born in this human realm, in this planet. Old age, sickness, death, the Buddha pointed to. These are natural to all of us. And every creature that's born grows up, gets old, gets sick, has diseases, and dies. So this is, this is a normal process uh, that, that, that we naturally are involved in the moment we're born into a, into a human body, into a conscious human form. Being conscious means that we, and being sensitive, in that we've got eyes and ears and a nose, a tongue, a body, we have an intelligent mind, we have a retentive memory, we feel everything. This is a sense realm, a sensitive realm. It's, this is a realm of feeling. We have to feel everything. We have to feel hot or cold, whether we like it or not. We have to feel hungry or full, or uh, whatever how conditions are, whether it's, it's a rainy, gray, cold, bleak day, or a bright, sunny one like today. Uh, we have very little control over what we're going to see all the time, whether it's going to please us or be what we want or the sounds that we hear, the odors that we, uh, that impinge on us, the tastes, and the, uh, the, the thoughts, the emotions that we experience in our mind. So the sensitivity is like this. Sensitivity is, is pleasant and painful and neutral. It's beautiful and ugly and neither beautiful or ugly. It's, it's uh, harmonious and, and melodious and lovely to listen to, or it's cacophonous, or it's neither. The sense realm, this realm that we live in, is, is this continuous impingement on the senses from the day you're born, isn't it? The, the sense world keeps impinging on you in, in some way or another. So that's the way it is. It, is not, why complain about it? Or take it personally? This is, this is the result of being born as a human conscious being in the universe. It's like this. So the Buddha was pointing to the way it is, what, what it really means to be born as in, a, in a human form, with eyes and ears and the senses and the mind and a physical body. So the Buddha used this as a way of reflection, like the five khandhas, he point, used 
the 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 rupa vedana sanya sankara vijnana the five khandas pointing to the five khandas he, he divided everything up in this universe into five categories so so in terms of your own experience isn't it the five khandas you can you can fit everything that you experience the universe that you that you're experiencing, the sensory impingement, and that into these five groups. Physical, the physical form, the body, the, the Vedana's feeling, what the through the senses, the sensitivity, the sense realm, pleasure, pain, and neither pleasure nor pain. Sanya Third khanda is perception. Uh, when we we perceive things in certain ways, we're conditioned to perceive something as uh, we give it a name. We we relate to it if we feel we 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 know what it is. Things that that don't we we can't quite place. We can't perceive as being anything. We tend to ignore. So the, from the day we're born, we, we become highly conditioned to, to, to live in a world that is, say, socially and culturally instilled in us uh, and acceptable to, say, our parents, our class, our ethnic group, our society. We see this is what, how it, this is, what is approved of. This is what is right to do. This is wrong. Um, we we're, we're told what is uh, what a good boy is, a good girl is, and what a good citizen is, and all the rest. We acquire a whole cultural conditioning that comes through this uh, through creating perceptions around experience, and then that those perceptions become we become attached to those perceptions. We experience the world through perceiving it in various ways, through various patterns, through various shapes and forms. And we proliferate on that. We, we develop a whole sense of our self-importance uh, through, say, the sankara, through, through endless kind of thinking and, and emoting and believing and attaching. And this is all taking place through consciousness through the conscious experience of life. Because when we're born, isn't it? When, we're, when a baby's born, it has a body and it's conscious. So these are, these are not conditioned yet. These are just natural states, the physical body and consciousness. But then as we develop, say, from that infantile state, we... we, we we're, we're conditioned to think about ourselves in various ways, to identify, identify with your body, to identify with uh, the color of your body, identify with some kind of ethnic perception, or identify with being belonging to a particular class or group or religion or nation or minority group or whatever, all these are conditioned into the mind through culture, through this uh, cultural conditioning. So, say, the unawakened, unenlightened human being is, is merely a kind of a program going on. You know, you get, you get a dose of it, and then, you, then this program is how you experience life through the perceptions that you've acquired. If you never awaken or change, then... The, the, the kind of uh, program that you acquired in your early years uh, just more or less goes on and on until you die. You don't, you don't step outside that. You just live in this world of conditioned experience and belief in it and attachment to it. And if it's challenged, sometimes it's very threatening, isn't it? When, like people that live very, a very narrow cultural attitudes are very frightened by, say, foreigners. 
we're frightened by anything that 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 is different from what we're used to. We can become very angry and and abusive and and violent just through our own attachment to some kind of ethnic identity or religious identity. So the aim of the Buddha was to awaken us to this process, to awaken us to these five khandhas, uh, to begin to understand why we create suffering through attaching to identifying with the physical body. Perceiving yourself as a as the physical body, then you suffer, don't you? If you're if you're not as I used to wonder why, you know, why God didn't create everyone equal. It wasn't fair that some people were better looking than others. <laughs> And that's not fair. If God were really fair, he would create everybody so they would be beautiful. At least that's how I thought. And, I <laughs> and why, why did, why was there, why some people really born in, you know, deformed states or either physical or mental? It's not fair in terms of an ideal of, of what should be. But in terms of awakening, of uh, awareness, of enlightenment. Sometimes our deformities, sometimes our liabilities are the very things that, that help us to awaken, and the suffering of our lives. Suffering is like it suddenly kind of punches you, it kind of bashes away at you until you suddenly start waking up. That's one way of looking at it. If life is just too easy, you're just too good looking and too wealthy and everybody just adores you. Well, why bother to come here? You know? <laughs> no fun sitting here. And if you could just be, you know, if you're being, having a lot of fun in life with just having a good time and everything's sweet and wonderful. So, it's always interested me, I've always found it very kind of remarkable that Buddha would choose uh, suffering as a focus, or dukkha as a focus, uh, putting that into what we call the first noble truth. That's giving a lot of importance, isn't it, to suffering. When we think, we just want to get rid of suffering, I don't want to suffer. I want, I want a religion where it's all about love and happiness. You know, that's more fun, isn't it? It's all about how wonderful uh, God is and about being happy and loving. These are positive perceptions that, that inspire and uplift the mind. And that when, we, when we think, like love, this word love is very, it inspires us. The idea of being, of loving, of being loved. It's a word that that, that inspires, uplifts the, the human heart. But when the Buddha taught his first sermon, he, was, he pointed to, not to love, but to dukkha as the first noble truth. Why? Why is that? Why would he do that? And of course, many people question this. They think Buddhism, Buddhism is a pessimistic religion. It's all about suffering. And then they, they even misquote. They say, Buddha taught everything is suffering. And you, if you're a Buddhist, you have to believe everything is suffering. Now that's a sure way to depression. <laughs> you believe that. That's what depression is. When you're depressed, you think everything is suffering. <laughs> I mean, really depressed, you can't imagine uh, anything that isn't suffering. Because the moment you start experiencing happiness, you're no, not depressed. <laughs> so so the, the commitment to suffering and attachment to suffering isn't, isn't what the Buddha was, was pointing to in the First Noble Truth. It's a statement, isn't it? He says, there is suffering. He's not saying everything is suffering. It's not a categorical 
proclamation. But it's it's a it's a it's a reflective teaching that there is suffering. Suffering that people suffer. We suffer. There is we do suffer. Everyone has to experience suffering. And so then suffering should be understood. So then the Buddha pointed not to to uh, how to get rid of it, how to get rid of suffering. The next, the next statement was, suffering should be understood. And to understand something, if you're just resisting it, trying to get rid of it, how can you understand anything at all if you're just taking a stand against it and trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible? So, so the natural reaction, as soon as you have a little bit of suffering, is trying to get rid of it. Or it's like physical pain, isn't it? I mean, when you're sitting here, the, the, the natural reaction, as soon as you feel a little bit of discomfort or pain, is to try to want to get rid of it. You know, that's a, that's a natural reaction to, to suffering. <clears throat> or if you're having uh, bad moods or bad thoughts or emotions, you want to get rid of it because it's suffering. But instead, the Buddha was pointing not to getting rid of, but understanding. And to understand something, you have to accept it for what it is. To understand something is embracing suffering, isn't it? It's like willing to experience suffering, willing to acknowledge it, willing to to consciously let suffering exist as it is, without, you know, and, and not, not trying to get rid of it. So it's like welcoming, isn't it? It's the, back to this this practice of welcoming. Anyway, during this retreat, I encourage you to to try this out. Just see see what happens. It's a it's a for you to test it out. What I'm saying. Don't believe me, but see see if it works. <laughs> you know, it's up to you to find out whether whether it works or not for you. But this, this welcoming uh, attitude to suffering. I remember just with uh, years ago, I used, I used to hate the feeling of uh, feeling that I'm confused about something. I liked I, what I loved is a, a sense of certainty and mental clarity. And emotional confusion, I really didn't like that at all. Uh, so. So there's always a kind of, as soon as I felt confused by anything, was to try to get some kind of clear answer, you know, make it clear and, and get rid of this confusion because it is an emotional state that I didn't want at all. So then through meditation I be, began to be aware of how much, uh, how much I resisted confusion as, a, as an experience. As soon as I felt confused, uh, I, I would either distract myself away from it, or or try to you know try to get some get somebody to say, "Is this right or is that right?" You know, I want somebody else to tell me. I want the authorities, the ajans, the 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 big guys, you know, to come and say, "Yes, that's right and that's wrong, that's good and that's bad." <laughs> And, and and you're 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 all right or you're all wrong, but I want to be clear, and I and I and I need somebody, an authority figure out there, somebody I can trust and that I respect, who will keep me, who will straighten me out all the time when I get confused. So, Ajahn Chah was very good at this. He could sense right away what I was trying to get out of him. <laughs> so he, I remember one time years ago, and I'd been in England for several years. Uh, when, it, when, when I went to England in 1977, uh, he, he and I, he w- we went there together, and he stayed there a month, and then he said, okay, you stay here, and, and I'll go back to Thailand. And so, and he said, and you can't come back to Thailand for five years. You have to stay in England five years. 
So and so I said, okay, I'll do that. Uh, so um, anyway, um, it was a good thing I made that promise because uh, the first year I wanted to go back to Thailand more than anything in in the world because <laughs> the first year was uh, was really confusing for me. Uh, it was living in London and and living in a house in in on a busy street in London and and there were all kinds of problems in the in, with the Buddhist group that invited me a lot of acrimony and bad scenes and, and I didn't ordain to get involved with all this I'm I want to go back to Thailand but then Ajahn Chah said you can't go back for five years so I stayed because I like to when I make a promise I try to keep it especially with somebody like Ajahn Chah so, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so then uh, uh, after f three or three or I think it was about three years or four years, he invited me back, and so I, I took. Uh, by this time, we'd acquired the Chitters Monastery, which was very nice, and I'd become quite happy living in, in the UK, and and uh, was was enjoying life there. This this uh, Chitters Forest Monastery was really beautiful, so I was quite uh, enjoying my life. And there was uh, one of the nuns at that time I invited to go with me back to Thailand. And, and I was telling her, we were starting to form this nun's order. Sister Sundra was, was there, was one of the first. And uh, this was Sister Chandasiri. And so on the way to Thailand, I kept telling Sister Chandasiri about this wonderful American nun that was with Ajahn Chah. I said, she's really wonderful, she's so wise, uh, she's so pure-hearted, and I, I think, you know, she'll really be able to help you a lot. When you get to Ajahn Chah's monastery, she'll receive you, and she'll be uh, a great inspiration for you in your, your nun's life. So we hit Bangkok Airport, and the first thing I hear is this this perfect nuns become a born-again Christian. <laughs> so I, that, that was like a punch in the stomach, you know. I was really embarrassed and confused and and how could she do that? You know, how could she become a born again Christian? <laughs> so then, when we went to Wat Pha Pong in Ubon, it was all the news, and I met her. I met this nun, and she was she tried to convert me to Christianity. <laughs> and and so I I was really confused by this. I remember going to Ajahn Chah. And, and he said, Lumpo Cha, Lumpo is a kind of respectful but affectionate term. Uh, so I said, Lumpo, I said, the, about Mayor Chi, come uh, um, I said, you know, uh, she's become a Christian. <laughs> and he says, yeah, he's smiling, he says, yes, she's become a Christian. <laughs> and I said, but uh, how could she do that? He says, well, I'm, and he looks at me with this kind of uh, mischievous smile and says, maybe she's right. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he got his point across very well. He says, uh, you know, here I was, you know, wanted an explanation, I was confused, how could somebody who I had all these kind of expectations and projections on to, you know, that she was, uh, how could she join a, even a, because the born-again Christian group in Uborn, they were, they were kind of repulsive people, you know, <laughs> really, not very intelligent kind of Christianity. <laughs> and how could she fall for it? So, so this, was, this was confusion. And did Lung Po Cha, what did he try to, 
explain it or put down the Christians or or the nuns. No, he just made me look at what I was doing. Maybe she's right. <laughs> no, I said that was that was something that began to see what I was doing, you know. This wanting a clear explanation, wanting to understand, wanting him to tell me that she'd done wrong, that she shouldn't have done that, that she she's betrayed the Buddhist religion, or, you know, to go into some kind of harangue about uh, uh, the Christians are hanging around the monastery trying to convert all the monks, and we've got to, we've got to stop them, and get into a, a kind of a defensive mode of behavior, feeling paranoia. But instead, Lung Pho Chao was just, was very skillful at getting us to look pointing to, to what, we, what, what we are doing, not trying to convince us about anything, but a direct pointing. So I started looking here at the confusion. When I began to embrace and to only accept the state of confusion, it dropped away. This is what I found. Rather than than getting rid of it through trying to just fight and resist it, through accepting it, through acknowledging emotional confusion, it ceased being a problem. It seemed to just dissolve into thin air. So this is why it, with mindfulness it is it's this emphasis the Buddha made, you find this, that's what's really unique about the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist teaching, isn't it? Mindfulness as a, as a means to examine suffering, to understand suffering, to recognize the causes of suffering. Suffering is not ultimate, is not permanent. Uh, it, ha- it's, it arises through causes. So we, in the Second Noble Truth, we we're aware of the causes of suffering, which are attachment to desires, wanting something, wanting something we don't have, not wanting what we have, and the attachment to these desires is the cause of suffering. So the insight into that is to let go of the causes. And to let go of the causes of suffering, you have to know, you have to examine, you, you need to really accept desire, to study, investigate, to know the feeling of it, know, the, know what attachment to desire is like, what it feels like, what it is as experience, rather than just take a stand uh, that, that you might think is a Buddhist one, that you shouldn't be attached to desires. You can hear, Buddhist saying, if you're a Buddhist, you're not, you shouldn't be attached to any kind of desire. You shouldn't have any attachments. <clears throat> Which is another misreading of the Buddhist teaching. It's, it's just the same, thinking that, that the Buddha said you shouldn't be attached to anything, like everything is suffering and you shouldn't be attached to anything. That's, those aren't reflective statements. Those are, those are kind of uh, categorical statements. But the, in the, the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, it's a reflective teaching. It's for awakening the mind, not to, not to grasp the, the, the Four Noble Truths, but to use those Four Noble Truths to awaken yourself to the, to the suffering, to the causes of suffering, to the end of suffering to the way of living within this human realm in which you do not create suffering around the experiences that we all have to uh, bear until death. So that the, the freedom from suffering that the Buddha is talking about isn't like we, we think, it isn't like uh, once you get enlightened, I don't feel suffering. I don't. I don't have no, any more pain, and I, and I don't. Uh, and there's no more grief, and there's no more stress. There's no more anything. I just, just happy, happy. 
completely kind of equanimous, a kind of a moronic way almost. This kind of everything's just fine all the time. Uh, is we think of enlightenment maybe is that once I get enlightened, then I, and then I won't feel pain anymore. I won't feel anguish. I won't suffer anymore. Or is the Buddha point in the way in which we do not create suffering anymore? And this is, this is what, what it means to me. The more I practice and meditate on the Four Noble Truths, the more I realize how not to create suffering around the conditions that I experience. So a lot of the conditions I experience are unpleasant, unwanted, and in themselves are unsatisfactory uh, conditions, but I'm not creating them. I'm not creating those conditions. Those conditions arise. And whether I create suffering onto those conditions, now I have a choice. Having contemplated and investigated those truths, then I have a choice. I can either get caught in the suffering that comes to me, and, and just attach to it and be overwhelmed by it. Or I can embrace the suffering that happens and, and through that acceptance and understanding of suffering, I do not create suffering onto the existing pain or the uh, unfair experiences or the criticisms or the, the misery that, that I see or experience through my senses. So then you realize, if you read the scriptures and the suttas, the Buddha, after his enlightenment, experienced all kinds of horrendous things, much worse than I've ever experienced. When you read the story of the Buddha, after his enlightenment, he was chased by a drunken elephant, his, his cousin tried to murder him, he had People kind of frame him and blame him and criticize him and ostracize him. He had difficult disciples and all kinds of, of uh, really extreme experiences after enlightenment. Much worse than anything I've experienced. <laughs> but in the but the Buddha didn't create suffering around those experiences. If you, you know, if you take an interest in the scriptures, Buddhist scriptures, the Pali Canon, then you begin to pick this up. The Buddha was experiencing physical sickness, stomach ache, back ache, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, people would would say terrible things about him, try to kill him, but. His, his response was never one of anger, resentment, hatred, uh, blame, but acknowledging. And so he didn't create suffering in his mind around the things that were happening to him. So he was a Buddha, one who is enlightened, who sees things as they are. So this is a really valuable thing to know, uh, uh, to me, to know this. Because I'm not ex- 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 asking for favors in life. I'm not asking to to get kind of get out of everything, and uh, hope that you know, if I meditate a lot, then I'll kind of get out of the unpleasant experiences of life. Because I know better. <laughs> I've tried that; it doesn't work. <laughs> but the but willing to accept life. Whatever it is, without making any pleas. I'm not asking God for any special privileges. I've been a monk 33 years. God, reward me (laughs) for for being a monk, for being a good boy for 33 years. (laughs) uh, Trying to to seek special special, uh, privileges from above. Or... A kind of a, a, and, and a willingness to experience life, whatever that involves, whether it's good health or bad health, praise or blame, happiness or 
suffering, success, or failure. Well, for me, this is this is this is, a, this is this is a very liberating teaching because no longer do do I feel a need to control or or hold on or try to manipulate conditions for my own benefit or try to you know or get or worry or feel anxious about my future there's a sense of trust and of confidence and a, a fearlessness that that comes through uh, this this sense of refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and knowing that no matter what happens to me, good or bad, then then I then I I have a refuge now t- in order to to learn from experiences that I have. Whatever that might be. So you can say that Buddhist meditation then is it's like a, a kind of maturing a development of the human psyche, where we we gr- grow up and and develop into a a a fully a complete and and really uh, excellent kind of being not by becoming anything but by letting go of everything and by learning to trust learning to relax learning to open to life learning to to investigate experience not rather than resist it or be frightened by it but even fear to to take an interest in in your own fear or your own uh, depression or despair because in the first noble truth there is suffering suffering should be understood the third insight suffering has been understood so it's a it's a, these three there's the the statement there is suffering as a, as the first insight the second insight is suffering should be understood the third insight is suffering has been understood. So the statement is made, suffering, the, the, the way to deal with it is given, understand suffering, and through the result of understanding or practicing or meditating on suffering, we have the insight, suffering has been understood. I understand suffering now. So suffering in this sense of dukkha is is really to take an interest in, not on a personal level of I'm suffering because I'm this way or that way, but but the seeing suffering as as a noble truth rather than as a personal problem. So just the feeling of confusion or or Ill, being uh, of anxiety about the future or or worry or physical disabilities or or emotional hang-ups, or whatever they are, to to understand it means to take an interest in them, to to really be willing to to look at them, to to look at them closely, to examine them as conditioned experience. Not you don't have to know why you suffer, but the actual suffering is like this: this kind of churning of the guts, or this this kind of feeling of being uh, of, of, of anxiety that hangs on in the human mind or or just the endless kind of worrying about the future or feelings of resentment that we carry from the past really life hasn't uh, we've had experienced so many disappointments or things that have been quite unfair to us we resent so that resentment is suffering. So we, we look at that suffering, we understand it, it feels it is this way. So we, we're, we're looking right at it, at the experience itself in the present and embracing that, what happened. 
it. I said, you have to find out <laughs> for yourself. <laughs> but uh, just to encourage you, from my own experience, it, 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 it works. It's definitely uh, something that that has given me uh, a way of, of of working through all kinds of uh, very immature emotional habits and and fears and and uh, self obsessions and self consciousness and resentments and so forth. And it's through not through distracting myself or holding on to to a, a high level of concentration, but through examining, through through reflecting, through contemplating, through welcoming the experience of life in order to to, uh, to have the opportunity to learn from it. So even some of the most painful um, things that, that I've been the emotionally painful experiences through this kind of practice are incredibly s- strengthening. You know, the suffering is, if you're willing to, to learn from it, you, you find what you really are. You find a, an unshakability of your mind, a strength that you never have if you, if you didn't contemplate and learn from the suffering that we experience in this life. So I offer this as a reflection for this evening. Sarukam <laughs> <laughs>